So uh, there's this old, this old preacher joke, story, illustration. You've probably heard it before, but goodness, um, I just think it's so good. And it's short. So the story goes that there was a chicken and a pig. You heard this one? All good jokes start with barnyard animals. Some people gave me a, a hard time for saying so many great things about Aggies last weekend, by the way. So I was going to say this could have been an Aggie joke, but it's not. This, this is, uh, you know, I got to keep my reputation. Chicken and a pig show up together. They're wanting to, to name uh, and begin a new breakfast restaurant. They were thinking it'd be a great idea to get together and do this breakfast thing. And they, they said, well, what would you bring to it? And what would you bring to it? In the midst of the conversation, the chicken says, well, I'm thinking that, that it should be like an egg restaurant. I'm going to give my egg to it. And he says, pig, what are you going to give? Why don't you, you want to give some bacon or some sausage? And he says, whoa, clearly this business venture is not going to work very well. And he said, what do you mean? What, what, what do you mean? He says, well, Mr. Chicken, all you're going to do is make a deposit for breakfast. I'm going to be given my life. Make sense? Chicken's just laying eggs. He got more where that came from. Pig, bacon, sausage. It's going to cost everything that I have. I look at the life of our church this way. I look at my own life in community this way. I look at the way that I invest myself in the lives of others. I look at the way that I invest my stuff into the world around me. And I have found that there is a significant difference between a deposit and an investment. Now, some would say that they have some commonality, some shared uh, things, and it's true. You make a deposit into your bank account, it's kind of an investment. But what I want to draw out today is the distinct differences that I have found between depositing, kind of making that, that drop, and investing. I'd like you to be willing to go with me this far to say that one of the key differences between deposits and investments are that deposits are short-term, investments long-term. Can you go that far with me at least? Deposit is kind of what the chicken was being willing to offer to the breakfast, and the pig investment was what he was willing to make as the investment. A couple weeks ago in church, we were talking about seeds being planted in us and being the right kind of soil to receive it. And then we, the next week, talked about being people who plant seeds in others as a way to get us into this grow sermon series, this year opening stewardship that we go into the G-R-O-W. And, and I told a story about a guy named Keith in my life. The summary was that I was at a church camp that I probably shouldn't have been at as a leader, at least, for the theme that was being taught. If you were here, you know what I'm talking about. And I was sitting at lunch with this guy named Keith. Maybe you remember this. You can go back and see the podcast if you want. But Keith was a guy who I'd spent that week with at camp and over lunch. He says to me, Brent, have you ever considered being a youth pastor? Remember, I told him no. I was a bartender and a basketball coach at the time, and I really enjoyed both of those things. And I thought that's what my value was. God could use me in those ways. But this guy said, by planting a seed, I just wondered if you'd ever considered it. Now, Keith, in that form, made a deposit in my life. And I don't underestimate the value of that deposit that he made in my life because as the rest of the story would unfold, it was that deposit, it was that seed that he planted that ended up being a seed from another and a seed from another until someone was willing to walk with me as the seed would begin to grow who would walk with me and water the seed that had been planted by someone else. Remember a few weeks ago, that's what we were talking about, that we don't all have the opportunity to plant a seed for the first time in the life of another, but undoubtedly we cross paths with folks all the time who have had a seed planted in them and are waiting for someone to come and water it. And some of us will water the seeds that have been planted by others through deposits, short-term passing. Some would say that in every human interaction you have with someone that you know or that you don't know, you're either leading them closer to the grace and love of Jesus or you've given them reason to dismiss or discount it. Now, some would say that all interactions aren't quite so, you know, black and white. But I have found that in my interactions with others, they are either leading me closer to the one I love or they're leading me away. Deposits can do that. And deposits have value. Hear me clearly. Deposits have value. Deposits can be used for good. But investments are better. 
Investments are better. And while I had Keith, who was a depositor into my life, who planted a seed into my life that others would then water, there was one who invested his life in me. This is a man, when I look back and think about who are the mentors in my life, this man always shows up as number one. This man's name was Ron Sumter. Now, Ron Sumter, for a long, long time, was the pastor of First Christian Church in Huntsville, Texas. In fact, at one point of his life, he was also the, uh, the chaplain for the Sam Houston State baseball team. If you grew up in Huntsville or know of Huntsville, he was at that church for 25 plus years. A great man, a great pastor, a great husband and dad. When he finished in Huntsville, he would do some interim ministries and ended up at my church in the Woodlands, the Woodlands Christian Church. And this past week, just for kind of a trip down memory lane, I walked back into that building and it's very different than it was when I was there on staff. And I walked through it and I went and sat in different places around the building that held memories for me, good memories and hard memories, but memories nonetheless. But when I walked in, one of the first things I wanted to see was Ron Sumter's office. It was right through the front door and about 15 steps into the right. It's a big office in the corner. He was our associate pastor and then he became our interim pastor when our lead guy left. And Ron saw something in me that I had not seen in myself and decided that in the final lap of his ministry, he was going to invest in me. And I'm so grateful that he did. And if you knew Ron and you knew the impact, if I could fully articulate the power that he had in my life, you would give thanks for him too. Because I would not be here today doing what I'm doing for you had I not had Ron investing in me. Ron invested in so many different ways. He invested in me in time. He made time for me. I remember I would be down in my office that was now the quilter's office down on the other side of the building. And I'd be in my office and I'd get a phone call from the intercom from his office. He'd say, hey, Sparky, that was the nickname he gave me. I think he had overheard that was my fraternity nickname too. Sparky, got your glove? And after the first time I did, I kept a glove in my office because what Ron wanted to do from time to time, we were in work, doing hard work, and he knew the value of rest, intermittent stopping to just go outside. And he'd say, meet me in the parking lot. So I'd get my glove and he'd get his and a softball and we'd go out into the parking lot at the church. We'd just play catch. Middle of the work day. Sparky, got a glove. Let's go. We'd just play catch. Time. Now that's kind of silly time, but there was a, another time that was really special to him. It was his lunch hour. At the lunch hour every day, he had this practice of going to St. Simon and Jude and sitting in what the Catholics would call adoration. And he would sit in that prayer room for the hour of his lunch. He would just rest. Rest in the presence of Jesus. And I used to ask him, where are you going for lunch? Can we go to lunch? He'd say, no, nah, I've got plans. Until one day he said, Sparky, you want to come with me? And I went with him. I didn't really know where we were going or what we would do, but we got there. And while I had thought he was always praying, I would learn over time that sometimes he would sleep while I prayed. <laughs> but nonetheless, we were doing it in a prayer room in the presence of Jesus. His desire was daily to spend this uninterrupted time. And he spent it with me. He taught me the value, sitting still quiet in the presence of God. It's a gift he gave me. It was an investment he made. But it wasn't just time that he gave me. It was his knowledge. If you were to go into my office today and look at my commentaries and look at a number of the books that I still reach from and read from, and you're going to open the front cover and you're going to see the scribble scratch of Ron Sumter written into the front. On those really bizarre days, if you have maybe confirmation worship service and you see me wearing a robe in worship... It was Ron's robe. I still wear the robe that Ron gave me. And the stole around my neck. There's a really good chance that it's one of the stoles that Ron gave me. He was committed to me. He was an encourager. He was passing on his knowledge, sometimes very obviously in things like books and sometimes through practice, just his way of being. Every Monday when I come to work to this day, very first thing that I do before I check emails, before I start down my to-do list, on my rhythmic week, my first step is to pull a couple cards and handwrite written notes. And I learned that from watching Ron. Because when I would go on a Monday morning eager to get back into work, hey, Ron, what are you working on? He'd say, Sparky, can you give me a little bit more time? Why, Ron, what are you doing? I'm writing thank you notes. For what? Well, didn't you hear that young lady sing that solo yesterday? Wasn't it beautiful? Yeah, it was awesome. Well, I think she would love to have a handwritten note letting her know so. And so he would write these thank you notes. It was the way that he began his week every week. And I asked him, I said, Ron, why do you do this? Like, why do you write handwritten notes? Couldn't you just email? He says, think about the mail you get. It's 
mostly bills. He said, the time that I'm taking to write this card will mean the world to them. And he said, it's not just for them, it's for me. He said, I have learned, discovered over time that a, a week that begins in gratitude always goes better. And so to this day, he's been deceased for a handful of years now. We haven't worked in church together since 04. But to this day, handwritten cards on my desk, first thing out the gate, because it matters. It matters for the people who receive my cards, and it matters even more to me who begins my week with gratitude for the gifts that God has surrounded me with. This is what he did for me, knowledge. And then finally, he was an encourager. When he and I were serving together in 2004, 2003, a young man in our student ministry had gone off to the Navy and came back, was one of my volunteers, and was, was tragically killed in a motorcycle accident. Now, I was a youth pastor. I'd never done a funeral before. And I went to Ron. I said, Ron, what can I do to help you with the funeral? He says, you can do the funeral. I said, Ron, I've never done a funeral. He goes, I believe in you, Sparky. You can do this. You knew that kid better than I know that kid, better than anybody in this room knows that kid outside of his dad. You need to do it. He encouraged me, and he helped me as I wrote together what I would write for that funeral. And, and on the day when the funeral came and I stood up in our sanctuary, and there were 500 people in a room that held 350, and they were all standing everywhere. He would just look at me with this, you got this. When I didn't have it, when I was weeping and I couldn't get words out, he's, you got this, he just kept. We need people in our lives to invest in us, not just to make deposits. We need people who see things in us and see things that we don't even see in ourselves and they call it out. And they put it out here in front of us so we can see it. And then they say, when we start to doubt whether that's in us, they go, no, 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 it's in you. And if there's something that we long to be in us and to see it grow in us, to have somebody come along and to say, I'm with you until it becomes big enough for you to see yourself. We need investors, investors in our lives. And this is what Paul was to Timothy. This is the person Paul was to the person Timothy. Now, we know Paul. Many of you know Paul because he's the guy who wrote most of the New Testament. Some of you know Timothy. Maybe you've been called to Timothy before. I'm called to Timothy from the church I was raised in. Paul was the mentor. Timothy was the student, the pupil. We find Paul meeting Timothy in the 16th chapter of Acts. I'm just going to start there, and then I'm going to move into some of the things that Paul said to Timothy, his protege. We have a clear case here in the Scriptures of a person who saw in another an opportunity to do more than just deposit, but rather to invest. And thank God he did. In chapter 16 of the book of Acts, this is the book that comes right after the four Gospels. It's, some would say, the continuation of the, the Gospel writer Luke. So you've got Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, and Luke's Gospel. Some would say it continues here in the book of Acts, where we tell the history of the church. Last week, we talked about Acts chapter 2 and a little bit of Acts chapter 4, where the early believers gathered together and what that first church looked like. Well, those first churches started to spread all over that area, and Paul was responsible for that, but he knew he needed others to help him, and so... It says in chapter 16, verse 1, that Paul came to Derbe and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was Jewish and a believer, but whose father was a Greek, maybe Gentile in the other words. The believers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him, Timothy. Verse 3, Paul wanted to take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area. For they all knew that his father was a Greek. It was important. You had to become, in this moment, you had to become a Jew first before you could become a Christian. And so Gentiles had to be circumcised. If you don't know what circumcision is, Google it. It's not a good sermon. As they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. So the churches were strengthened in the faith, and they grew daily in numbers. Sounds kind of like Acts 2 and 4. People who gathered around the Word of God, who listened to his teachings, who shared, who sold stuff so they could all be one together. This church would grow, and as it says even here in chapter 16, 14, 14 chapters later, the churches were strengthened in the faith, and they grew daily in numbers. Every day, they just kept growing. People being inspired by this way of living together, being inspired by the words that were being taught, the truth that was being found the power in the apostles' teaching. What we find out here early on in chapter 16 is that Paul doesn't pass through Lystra, meet this guy Timothy, and say, let me make a deposit in you, let me give you a teaching and move on. But in, instead, he saw something in Timothy. He says, I, I need you to come with me. 
I need you to come with me. Maybe it was something about his faith. We don't really know for sure what it was specifically about Timothy that got Paul really intrigued by him or excited by him. But nonetheless, he takes Timothy with him. If you continue to read through the rest of the book of Acts, you're gonna find that Paul invests in Timothy, that, that Paul teaches him, he encourages him, and it feels a lot like what Ron did for me. In one moment in 1 Timothy chapter four, a letter that Paul writes to Timothy, he says this to the young man. He says, command and teach these things. Don't let anyone look down on you because you're young, but set an example for the believers in speech and in conduct and in love and faith and in purity. He says, until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture and to preaching and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift that was given to you through prophecy when the body of elders laid their hands on you. He says, be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Paul says to Timothy, watch your life and your doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you'll save both yourself and your hearers. Paul circles back to Timothy to give him these encouraging words to remind him of the things that he had been teaching when they were face to face in community. Now, geographically, they are separate. Paul said, but don't forget these things. In verse 12, he cheers for him. He says, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. Set the example. The way you talk and the way you act and the way you love, go for it. I know you can do it. I've seen you do it with my own eyes. Now do it with them and don't let them poo-poo on you because you're a kid. Don't let them say you're a nobody. I just realized I said that out loud, sorry. <laughs> don't let people look down on you and go boo, 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 boo because you're young. You're a kid, you can still teach. You're a youngster, you still have something to offer is what he's, he's saying. He encourages him in verse 14. He says, don't neglect your gift. This gift was given to you through prophecy. The people of God saw this gift in community, laid hands on you, and asked God to bless you and to allow his spirit to show up to you and through you through these gifts. He's encouraging him. And, and then in verse 16, he, he offers him some accountability. He says, watch your life and your doctrine closely. Persevere in these things that you're doing. This accountability, like I'm watching, I'm listening, I'm here for you, I'm paying attention to you. You got it in you, now go, 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 go do it. It's an investment. It's an investment he's making. He is literally raising him up. And this is what you do when you're investing in another person. When you're investing in a thing, you raise them up, you raise it up. You allow it to be right here in front and you encourage and you push and you cheer. When he met Timothy, he saw something in him and he walked with him. He invested in him. Timothy had for him in Paul what many a young person at the Willens Methodist Church has had in the Eglins. Many of you won't know the Eglin family. I know the Eglin family because I've gone to mission trips with them. I've been in the kitchen with them. I've had ice cream sandwiches after hours because of them. But the Eglins are a couple who worship on our Woodlands campus who have invested themselves in our student ministry at the church. And so I want you to see this video that kind of shows that what Paul did for Timothy, you can do for another, even now, even here. There was a sign up. I put my name down and I was gonna help with girls. I have three boys at home and I thought it was gonna be fun. It was only a one year thing. Um, boy, was I wrong. <laughs> You know, saw what she was doing and all the fun that she was having. I'm like, well, hey, I kind of want to be part of that. Now i am uh, been a small group leader for the senior guys now. I started when they were freshmen. When you go to an event that Rebel Base puts on, God is in that room. And I feel like I look around and I'm like, we're the only adults that are witnessing how awesome this is. And how I remember telling Mark Swayze, we need more people in here to witness God move. And I don't think I would have seen it as much as I had if I hadn't been with students that just are free to do whatever in worship. They raise their hands, they don't care who's around them. Um, they just worship in a way that you don't see. I think a lot of them, they just want somebody to listen to them. Just, just for them to know that somebody's gonna be there for them. They're gonna listen, they're not gonna judge me. Just getting to hang out with them, hearing their stories, just learning about them and trying
try to help help them stay on the right path. I think that it takes a lot of people who invest in your children to make sure they stay on the right path, that they love God, that they love others. There's a lot of times where there's some heavy stuff that goes on with some of the students. And to me, I can't imagine not having Fred to talk about it, to pray about it. She has a better perspective on things that they're going through and maybe some advice to give to me as to what to tell them or how to deal with it. You know, she's dealing with girls, so I'm just like, hey, this is, <laughs> I mean, I do what I can. <laughs> Cookies always make everything better. <laughs> My original girls, the OGs, I'll call them. Um, I will get phone calls every once in a while. Hey, this is going on, I really need you to pray for me. I know they're reaching out to me for a reason, right? They know that I'm always gonna be there, like no matter what, I'm always gonna be there. When they went off to college, <laughs> I lost a bunch of kids. They're so fun, I love teenagers. They're just unique individuals. It's the best thing I've done. the best thing I've done. You know, there's always so much more in a video than can be told. But I was reminded this morning that one of the young ladies who was in her OG group is our very own Connie. Connie Wilson. Everett, our sound guy, his, his wife. She was one of the OGs. And Connie was one of, Connie and, and Everett are now serving as volunteers, as servers in our student ministry on our campus. And Connie's employment is she is the assistant. She's kind of like the PAM, ministry assistant, ministry coordinator for the loft. Largely because of the investment that this lady made. Now, when you look at these videos, you see all those students. You're like, oh my gosh, that's so overwhelming. I couldn't do that. If that's you, you don't have to go do that. You could do it here on our campus where it's a little bit smaller, more intimate, where relationships are a little bit easier to come by. If that like, gets you excited and motivated and you need to sign up for everything the students are doing this summer because it'll be just like that all summer long. These young people need us. Those children in there need us. I remind you that I'm not in asking you to jump in so you can serve, so that you can check a box because we need you so badly, though we need you. We're inviting you to do what Paul has done for Timothy and what the Lord has invited us to do. Not only invited, but commanded that we do. Invest in the lives of others. It may not be with teenagers, it may not be with children, it may be with a peer. So how do we start? Like, I don't know how to do this with other people. Like, investing in other people is a little scary to me. What if they didn't like me? What if they said I didn't have anything to offer? Well, then let me just talk to some of you in the room who have people living in your home who are waiting for this. You see, Paul didn't start from scratch with Timothy. Paul knew something else about Timothy. He says it, if you just turn one page, at least in my Bible, you get to 2 Timothy. And in the letter, the second letter that Paul writes to Timothy, he, he says this, he says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, in keeping with the promise of life in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dear son, now, Timothy was not Paul's son, literally, but this is the way Paul looked upon him. Grace and mercy and peace from the Lord, from God the Father and Christ our Lord. But then he says this, he says, I thank God whom I serve as my ancestors did with a clear conscience, as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. And then this moment, I'm reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice. And I am persuaded now lives also in you. You see, Paul didn't start this whole thing. In reality, Paul was kind of watering seeds that were planted by someone else. Planted by grandma. Planted by mom. And as Paul says, he believes is now in Timothy. If you have children in your home, you have no excuse. You have no excuse not to take this investment thing seriously. You have no opportunity to do anything but invest in the lives of those who are in your home. It's your responsibility. I have people come to me oftentimes and they'll say, Pastor, wouldn't it be great if our church had like a children's ministry that was separate from us so that we could just worship and our kids could do what kids do? And 
And pastor, are we ever gonna have a church where the teenagers just go to their own room and do their own thing while we adults worship? Nope. It's not in the vision. It's not our plan. We know from experience, sociologists have studied this for years, we know that kids learn to love Jesus because they see you loving Jesus. Not because some stranger told them they should do it. It's your responsibility to raise your children in the way of Jesus. It's your responsibility, it's not mine. You have them seven days a week, we get them for an hour. We can't teach them enough in an hour. You live your life in front of them. Had someone reach out just this morning, coming to worship with you and your church. What do you have for children? I was so pleased to be able to say we have a great thing for children. Our children's church is awesome. And we're also gonna give you the gift of getting to stand next to your child and show them how to worship the Lord. We're also gonna give you an opportunity to watch them with a smile on their face that can't wait to come and give their offering. We're gonna allow your children to bring out the very best in you, to remind you of your responsibility to them, that they never lose the joy that they're experiencing now. If you want your children to follow Jesus, you have to follow Jesus. And part of my responsibility is to you, to invest in you. And it's your responsibility and your opportunity to invest in the people beside you. But it starts in your own home. You know Proverbs 22, eight. If you raise a child in the way they should go, they won't flee far from it. That could be taken figuratively. If we raise each other's children in the way they should go, they won't flee far from it. And that's what kind of keeps our church focused on this family ministry. But specifically and intentionally, what the Solomon, the proverb writer was saying was, no, 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 the kids in your house, if you will take the time to not just make random deposits when you happen to think of it, but would you would invest yourself in their faith development, you would invest in the prayers that you pray with them every day. You would invest yourself creating priorities that are Jesus first, world second. If you would invest yourself into acknowledging and recognizing what they're doing on their phones, what's leading them closer to Jesus and what's taking them farther from Jesus and from what Jesus says about them, you're investing time and energy into this generation. You have no way out of this. It's your job. It's the most treasured, sacred opportunity you've been given. And it's yours. But we're here to join you. We're here to help you. We're here to support you. And that's why we have a children's ministry. And that's why we have a student ministry. And if you're trying to figure out what's going on in the lives of teenagers, you go to Thomas Lake over here. You go to Ellen Bailey. And you say, what's going on? Or you go to come here on a Sunday night or a Wednesday night. And you talk to our other servers that are here serving alongside Aaron Mares and, and the Everett and Connie Wilson and others. And you say, how do we love our teenager better? They can show you. They can teach you. But we do this all together. But first, it starts in your home. I want to give you a couple other pointers real quick as we wrap to a close. I was thinking a lot about our role as investing in the lives of others. But before you can invest faithfully and well in others, you've got to think about who's investing in me. Who am I taking my lead from? And I, was, I had this thought as I was out on a long run yesterday, other than just when is this going to be over? I had this other thought when I was running. And it was this word from the Lord that said, Brent, who's pouring into you? Who are you following? Who, who are you setting as your example? Who are the people that you're trying to learn from and be encouraged by? And, and I felt this word come to me and said, you need to remind the people, if the, the people they're following, if the person they're trying to become more like isn't also trying to become like Jesus, they need to stop now and find someone else to follow. I thought, man, I don't know, is that gonna speak to anyone? And the Lord came back and said, there are people in your room who are trying to be like their boss. They see a successful boss, I'm gonna be like my boss and I'll get to be successful like my boss. The Lord wants me to tell you that if your boss is not following Jesus, you're following the wrong leader. You may end up with all the stuff that he has or she has, but you will not become any closer to the person that God's created you to be. You will not fulfill life to the full the way God's intended for you to experience life to the full. If you're following someone who's not following after Jesus, I was encouraged by the Lord. He just kept saying, and say to the men and the women, say to all of them in the room and say to the teenagers in the room too, if you have a social media following, if you're following someone in particular on social media, you can't wait to read what they say next. You can't wait to see what they do next. You can't wait to see what they wear next. You can't wait to see what they buy next. You can't wait, you can't wait, you can't wait. You become their little groupie. If they're not chasing Jesus, if they're not learning from Jesus, if they're not leading you towards Jesus, cancel them from your group. They're not worth following. You're gonna end up where they are, empty and alone. If they're not following after Jesus, they're not worth following. 
And we need to take a moment to think about who are we following, who are the people we long to be like. If they're not longing to be like Jesus, you do no longer need to long to be like them. It's dead end. And then finally, uh, to wrap, just in brief, I just wanna remind you that in the life of our church, that investing is more than just our time. Deposits, investments, it's more than time. And as you came in this morning, you saw in your bullets, and I don't even have one in my hand, but I loosely know what they say. There was an envelope in there. And the envelope that's inside your bulletin, it reminds us that as a church, not only are we looking to become people who make more than deposits in the lives of others, that we truly invest ourselves in the lives of others, we also recognize that as members of this church, and again, right now I'm talking to the family, that as family, if we want this to be the kind of place where young people learn to follow Jesus because of the examples of those around them, where young people are given opportunities to serve because that's what Jesus did, if we want to continue to be that kind of a place, continue to have staff members who invest in us, have ministries and programs that allow us to become the best versions of ourselves, the person that God created us to be, it takes an investment of more than just our time and our energy. It takes the investment of our resources. And today is the first of a couple Sundays where we're going to remind you of this. To remind you that if you, if you said yes to joining this church family, if you said yes to wanting to be a part of this family, you, you said yes to more than just showing up to worship. And I can celebrate that we as a church model that we are more than just a gathering of people who showed up for worship to see what we could get out of this instead of what we could give to it. Every Sunday, I, I watch people serve. Every month, I see the budget. I see the money in and money out, and we're always in the black. That's you. That's your faithfulness. And so today, I just simply want to give you space. I'm going to offer a word of prayer in a moment, and the band's going to come up for our last song. But I want to invite you to consider is my, the way I'm living life amongst these people. I want you to think about it in two ways. I want you think about it first in the, in the way of am I offering deposits to the people around me, or am I investing in the people around me? Who am I investing in? Is there someone in my home that I've been just dropping deposits because I didn't have a well to grab from to give them more than just a little here and a little there? Is there somebody who could teach me a little bit more if I would ask them to invest themselves in me so I could become more the kind of dad I want to be, more the kind of husband I want to be, more the kind of wife and mom, friend and employee I want to be? But more than just time, more than investing our lives, the second is how am I going to invest the stuff that God gave me? How am I going to take all that God has given me and then turn around and give it back so that God's will could be done in this community? How am I going to take all the graciousness and goodness and mercy of God that he's given me in my job and in my, in my means? How am I going to take that and be a good steward as I give it right back out? Now, you have an envelope with a card in it. I think, does everybody have one of those? Everybody should have one of those. And if you're a member of our church, this is specifically for you. If you're not a member of our church, this is just something for you to kind of be an audience of, and you can sing and worship as we go into that in just a second. But I want to say to you, every year um, I say this, not, again, hear me clearly, this is not about bragging. This is about setting a standard. The Parker family, this day is so easy for us, because on this day, we pull out the card, and we say, okay, how much are we going to make in 2022? We multiply that by 0.1, that's 10%, that's the biblical tithe, and we write our, on our card, this is what we're gonna give this year. 10% of everything we make, we're just gonna write it out and give it right back to the church because this is what we believe the Bible teaches. Now, I've been leading churches for a long time, this one now for six, and I've been a part of churches for 20 plus years, and I know that sort of the standard uh, family gives about 3% of their income. <laughs> And, and I'm not saying that that's a, a bad thing. There's a sacrifice there. You give 3% of anything, it's a, it's a sacrifice. I just want to remind you that, that God gave you all of it. He gave everything to you. You didn't earn any of it. And if you think you earned it, please make an appointment with me so I can prove you otherwise. Please make an appointment with me. Please. Don't go home saying that pastor's full of it. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He's, the Lord didn't give us all this. I worked hard for my money. Please make an appointment with me. We will have not been formed into the likeness of Christ until we come to this place recognizing that everything, even the breath we breathe, came as a gift. Nothing we did to earn anything we got. You have received stuff you didn't deserve, and now you've been asked to be a good steward of it. 
The gifts that you've been given, use those and work hard. Absolutely, use the gift that God gave you of hard work, the ability to use your hands, the ability to use your feet. Not everybody has those abilities. The ability to use your brain, not everybody has those abilities. Some of you would say, yeah, I know that's right. But whatever you have in you, out you, God gave it to you. And I think it's a pretty stinking good deal that God says, I'm gonna give it all to you and you get to decide how much you're gonna give back to bringing the kingdom to this earth. You get to decide. That's a pretty great privilege we've been given. But I'm gonna say, it's a pretty good deal to get to keep 90%. You take that business deal every day of the week. That's the, that's the deal that God's given us. I give it all, and you just give a little bit, like 10%. That's like less than what the government asks. Put things in perspective, seriously. So I wanna invite you to take your card, and I'm gonna offer a word of prayer so that we can let the Lord, let the Spirit of God compel you to give what you want to give. Again, this is just church family. If you're visiting, this is not for you. You don't have to be a part of this. Uh, And quite honestly, we don't necessarily need you to give. The church family has been doing a great job for six years, and we'll do good again. We always do. But let's pray as we, as we consider what God might be calling us towards. God, you have given us everything, everything. You've given us this life. You've given us the loved ones in our lives. You've given us the breath we breathe and the food we will eat. You've given us this church family. You've, you're just a giver. You just keep giving and giving and giving. You gave us that last paycheck. And you gave us the breath we're breathing right now. You just give, you're a giver. God, first we thank you that that you are such a kind and generous God that you would surround us with people who can call out the best in us. People who plant seeds of of goodness and mercy in us. People who, who show up and tell us about you. People who come alongside of us and encourage us and uplift us and remind us how to live as people created by you who sit with us when times are tough, who cheer with us when times are great, this community that you've given us. God, first, I I thank you. I thank you that that you send people into my own life and the lives of these people that just simply drop a deposit. They're short-term givers in our lives, and man, we, we receive those with gratitude. Give you thanks for that just passing moment when someone dropped a gift on us, just a deposit. But God, if we think a little harder, a little longer, we have someone come to mind that invested their lives in us, would not give up on us. They walked with us for a long, long time. They called out the best parts of us. They cheered for us when the world was booing us. They lifted us up when others were trying to push us aside. They were compassionate and encouraging. We give you thanks for them. And knowing how good it felt to be on the receiving end of that, God, I pray that you would bring to us the face of one, the life of one that you may be calling us to invest in. Maybe an investment in the people that are under our roof. It may be an investment in our grandchildren who share our last name. It might be to invest in a younger coworker, coworker who who may be going their own way and it's not a way that's gonna lead to life to the full. Maybe we have an employee or a coworker, a peer who needs this encouragement, this investment of our lives. And God, we know that it takes our resources. There's a reason, Jesus, you talked about money more than you talked about anything else. It's because you knew that where our priorities lie and all we had to do was go to our calendar and our bank account. We'd see exactly what's most important to us. And so God, I pray right now in this moment that you would remind us, you would encourage us in the way that we look at the stuff you've given us. That you would make it very plain that you've given us everything and all you're asking for is a little bit back. That we would share the way the first Christians did so that all would have everything they need. God, we thank you for this opportunity to participate in your kingdom coming to earth. And we offer just our little bit. We know it's not much, but it's all we have. And we give it to you in Jesus' name.